I've kind of been following De Beers for, for years now, but I feel like the, the whole picture is hard to really see. Who controls the global diamond market? So De Beers used to. So back in the 80s and 90s, they had 80 to 85 percent market share, essentially a monopoly. Uh, now they have roughly 30 percent market share. Um, Al Rosa out of Russia has a large part also, as well as a lot of other mining companies out there. So when you talk about market share, you're only talking about diamonds that are mined and, from the earth and then cut. But lab-grown diamonds have been an incredible phenomenon lately. How much market share do they have of the overall picture? So interestingly, in the U.S., this quarter, more than half of engagement rings in the U.S. will have a lab-grown center. This is from 2% in 2018. So the FTC in 2018 said a lab-grown diamond is a diamond. It legitimized it. Uh, and since then, we've just seen an explosion, uh, partly due to price. So lab-grown diamonds are now 90% cheaper than the natural equivalent. So if you're looking at a 90% cheaper. And I mean, if I brought you uh, two, you know, two carat rings, one was lab-grown and one yeah. was actually mined, would you be able to tell the difference? No jeweler in the world can. They're chemically, physically, optically identical. Um, so yeah, only labs can because one has small traces of nitrogen, the other does not. Uh, but to the naked eye, there's no way to tell the difference. I mean, what's the sales pitch then for a real diamond? Why would I pay 10x the price of something that can't be um, told apart from, you know, the lab grown? It's tough. Um, that's why market share is changing the way it is. I think in the next five years, 80% of diamond engagement rings will have a lab grown center. The 20% will be if you're a Harry Winston or a Graf or a Tiffany, that um, that end of the market will still go with natural because the brand is super important. Well, as far as they know, right? It yeah. could be a lab-grown diamond parading as a natural diamond. Yeah. And that's where you have to trust the jeweler. So Graf wouldn't do that, De Beers, uh, you know. So that, that's, I think, a part of the story as well. But it's a very difficult proposition now going forward. I, um, I think there's structural issues. Um, when I think of De Beers today, I kind of think of Kodak, where uh, you know, the industry has changed dramatically and it's not coming back. Right. So w what does this move from Anglo-American mean to you? Does it really change, um, you know, the structure of how these things are mined and shipped and sold? So historically, what, ha what De Beers has done is they have 80 customers, which are called site holders, and those customers have to buy from De Beers. So De Beers will say 10 times a year, this is your parcel. They buy that parcel, they cut and polish that and then uh, wholesale out into the market. That structure may very well remain. The, the problem that I'm seeing is De Beers itself went from a operating profit of 550 million in 2022 to minus 314 million in 23. And I think this year will be even lower. So revenue for De Beers, for example, in 2022 was 6 billion on the, um, the core operation mining operations. It went down to 3.6 billion in 23. So 40% drop. Uh, in a high fixed cost business like mining, that becomes very difficult. And this year will be even tougher. So historically, they've been the proponent for natural diamonds and they've spent a lot of money on marketing behind that. They're no longer able to do that. A, monopoly power is gone. And, and B, the core economics of the business are very difficult. Right, so um, what else in the supply chain has changed the story? I mean, obviously lab grown diamonds have been the big, the big whammy, right? Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Russia as a big supplier, and that yeah. can't be helpful considering sanctions. So with sanctions now in the U.S., it, it no longer you can no longer import Russian diamonds. We stopped doing that a year and a half ago as a company. Um, but what has happened is a lot of the Russian diamonds are now going to China, the Middle East, India. So the supply chain has changed a little bit. Where De Beers is primarily supplying to the U.S., other companies are supplying to the Eastern markets. But you still, I imagine, get Russian diamonds through India or China, right? I mean, um, there's no way to tell if it came from Russia if you buy it from Mumbai. There, there's disclosures at the source. So from Bombay, if you're buying, for example, you would the, the vendor will disclose that this is a Russian diamond and you can no longer import it into the U.S. So that has structurally changed. I think the other structural change is there's a huge migration toward colored gemstones. Uh, so, for example, 30% of brides today would prefer a colored gemstone and already 15%. Meaning 15%. what, a ruby, an emerald, a sapphire, or do you mean a colored diamond? Uh, so both. Yeah. Uh, but ruby, emerald, sapphire, aquamarine, tanzanite are alternatives that are growing very quickly. 
So in the same time, for example, that asset prices on the diamond side have fallen by 35 to 40% over the last two years, color stones are booming. Um, so they've gone up anywhere from 12 to 15% per annum over the last four years. Uh, some of the niche stones like pearls um, have gone up 35 to 40% per annum. Uh, so there's a big shift in the market. Color gemstones used to be 5% of engagement rings. Now they're over 15% and growing very quickly to that 30% number. Um, so as a result, diamonds, natural diamonds used to be 90% of all engagement rings in the US. Mm -hmm. Now it's only a third. So lab wow. is 50% and color is 15%. So you're left with less than 35%. Um, and that's all over the last six years. So structural changes in both consumer preferences and pricing. Uh, and it's playing itself out right now. So the diamonds are forever this romantic idea that that's what you have to have to seal the deal is no longer the case. That's right. Uh, you know, it used to be the D flawless, so colorless and flawless was what everybody strived towards. And you know, two carat to three carat was really the optimal size that everybody dreamt of. That is no longer the case. Um, so diamonds used to be financial flex. You can show off that it's a two carat ring or a three carat ring. Now with lab grown being 90% cheaper, it's much tougher. So that two carat that cost $25,000 natural is $2,500 lab. Um, so that part of the equation is gone. They used to also be an inflation edge, so kind of a security blanket. That is also gone because, as you can see, diamond prices are falling very quickly. Yep. So the use case for natural diamonds is going away.